So this is uh, JavaScript everywhere is the title of the talk. So first of all, motivation. Why do we want JavaScript everywhere? Exactly, why do we want JavaScript everywhere? So let's have a look at a typical web architecture. So we have a browser over here running JavaScript. Server, <coughs> normally having Java or some other kind of similar language. And then we might use XML, that is now really, I can't see it too well, to talk between the two. And then we have our database, and we typically have SQL there. So we've got a number of languages here, we've got JavaScript, we've got XML, we've got Java, we've got SQL, and there's a lot of boilerplate code to go between SQL result sets into Java, and then Marshall into XML, and vice versa. So the question is really, can we simplify this? Does it always have to be this way? So we probably can, but what are our constraints here? So basically it's the, the browser language, JavaScript. We can't go around and change all the browsers in the world and say, right, we're going to use Scala as your scripting language, for example. Yes. <laughs> so, <clears throat> given that constraint, can we use JavaScript everywhere? So, can we use JavaScript in the browser? Well, of course. Can we use JavaScript on the server? Well, yeah, with the advent of Node.js, it becomes now plausible to run JavaScript outside the browser. Can we use JavaScript as the payload? Well, yeah, we've been using JSON for quite a while, which is just plain old JavaScript. And can we use JavaScript in the database rather than SQL and the, the data with it now? Yes, we can with JSON document databases. So, let's go back to our diagram. How did this look? Well, we can take the server and we can switch it to JavaScript. We can take the XML, we can switch it to JSON. We can take the SQL and switch it to even more JSON. And so then we have a JavaScript web architecture, which is JavaScript everywhere. So let's delve into this. Oh, this, yeah. Penguin was an experiment into this architecture, so my training, which I did last year, was basically boiling down from these ideas what would an application look like. So let's delve into the server side of this a bit more. <coughs> so on the server side, to run JavaScript, I can say Node.js, <laughs> um, we probably have Node.js, which is relatively new, but it's a JavaScript runtime to run JavaScript outside the browser. So it's, it's quite low level, it's a bit like the JRE, but for JavaScript. Um, and you have lots of middleware which sort of builds on top of it for high level constructs. So you can have a very quick, simple, super simple example of Node. Hello world. Here we are, we've just got a little JavaScript <coughs> file, we're just writing out console.log, hello world. To run nodes, just from the command line, just run nodes with the file, no compilation, and surprise, surprise, we get hello world. The great thing is, no browser is required. So it's pretty good for Hello World, but can we really write scalable, massive JE computing applications with this? Well, there's a few sort of extra tools which Node and friends sort of bring to the table. So Node's got the concept of modules. So this is like a module system to break up your monolithic Java files into sort of smaller components, which you can then import like packages that you can with uh, Java. So let's have a look at an example there. So here we're requiring a file system module here. And here we just write out how they go to a text file which fits into a text file. So we can quite easily just bring in other components, namespace them off. So the sort of the namespace hell of JavaScript on the client side is kind of mitigated by this. And then we have NPM, <coughs> which is the node package modules. So this is another tool which comes bundled with Node, and this essentially allows you to sort of manage your dependencies like Maven does in Java. So rather than having a, a POM XML, which would be very verbose, as we all know and love, we have a package.json, and this is just more JavaScript. So we've got the JSON, so let's walk through this. So we've got a name, We've got the version, and we have our dependencies. So here we depend upon a, a third-party dependency called Express. Um, and we've got version ranges, 3.x, so 
much like we made in hand, but a lot simpler. And then we run this just from the command line, just like Maven, we just do npm install. That goes off to the main repository, downloads all your dependencies, and stores them into a special directory local to your project called node underscore modules, and then all of its transitive dependencies as well. So then once you've got that present within Node, it's very easy just to say require express, as I did before with the, the file system module, and then you can start to work with Express, so it's got some good constructs, which brings us nicely on to Express. What is Express? Well, it's a web application framework for Node. So, like I said, Node is very low level, um, and Express builds on top of that with sort of high level constructs that you'd expect from a, a web server, like delivering files. Uh, so, Express example is a big chunk of code. First of all, we require the Express module. And once we've access to that, we can just instantiate a brand new app. And then this line here basically registers a handler for the get requests <coughs> on the path of slash high to a function that just writes out hello world to the response. And then here on the app, we just say listen to port 8080. And we just print it to the log <coughs> that we are listening. So that in itself is a complete web server. So that's like a web app and a web server all in one in about seven lines of JavaScript. So to run this, we just go straight to the command line, node, run the file. Sure enough, it's listening. So we pop open another process and we can just curl that URL and we get hello world out. So it's pretty simple. So Restify is another library that's very similar to Express, but it's more geared towards RESTful services. So this is um, this is quite handy for uh, if you're not just delivering content and doing templates, and you actually just want to provide JSON. So another example, uh, very similar. We bring Restify, we create a server, we register a handler for a GET request and hi, and we write a hello world. Sure same thing happens. But the difference is that we can also write out JSON very easily. So if we're doing a web service that wants to supply a, a, a JSON representation, um, then here we can register I and we can write out a bit of JSON there, hello world. So it just puts out the map, we curve it, and we get JSON. So it's very easy, you don't have to do any marshalling on marshalling. Anything like that. You do have to write a JSON by hand. <coughs> you have to write a JSON by hand, isn't it? Mm. In that example. But it could, could it just be from, an object though. Yeah. It could come from elsewhere. Because <coughs> JSON is just an object. So you can just write that out. So it could come from other sources. But we'll get to that in a bit. <laughs> Probably might. So can we do JavaScript on the server? Well, looks like we can with Node.js and Express and Restify. And can we use it as a payload? Yeah. Again, with JSON and Express Respire, it's very easy. So let's uh, go to the database side. Let's see what we've got here. Good question to ask is, do you really need a database? A lot of apps are very small and something in memory might work or you might just want to write to a local file. In fact, I mean, that's how Penguin started out, to have a little memory database and then Simon wrote some code to put it out to a file. Uh, for sort of longer term persistence and you know that can get you off the ground and that can work for a lot of small cases but typically yes as soon as your service starts to scale then you need all the benefits that databases bring. So what do we normally do? We normally go and get a nice relational database and then we manipulate it using some SQL and we do that over JDBC or with inside an object relational mapper like Hibernate or JPA or just to access your domain model. Mm. It was just a little bit overly complicated, just wondering if we can get to the crux of what we're trying to achieve here. So we can simplify if we look outside of relational databases. So relatively recently, big data has been a big thing with Google and Facebook and their zettabytes of uh, social data which they're trying to process and they've eventually realised that relational databases don't really scale to that order of magnitude. 
So out of the big data movement spawned NoSQL, which is a bit of a misnomer because it's not necessarily targeting SQL, it's more just relational. It should really be called NoWell. So you've got different flavours of NoSQL databases. There's key value databases, which is like massive hash tables. You've got column family databases. You've got graph databases like Neo4j. And, and you've got document NoSQL databases, which <coughs> kind of sound good to us, especially if they're JSON document databases. So there's different flavours of these document NoSQL databases. So which one? should we choose? It really comes down to a trade-off between availability and consistency, because if you want big data, you want to be able to scale your database, you want a network partition just to be able to increase arbitrarily, um, and due to the uh, less known cap theorem, you can only have one of these two properties with the other property, so you've got to choose between what's more important, is it availability or consistency? So CouchDB is an Apache project, it's a document NoSQL database. This one is always available, but it's eventually consistent. So the data that you actually receive might not be the current truth of the data. It, the truth eventually sort of propagates through the database, a bit like DNS does. And then on the other side, we've got MongoDB, thanks to my sponsors. And this one is always consistent, so what you see is absolutely true. But it's not always available, so that's the trade-off. So it really depends upon what's more important, is it consistency or availability for your application. When I was writing Penguin, <coughs> consistency was a bit more important than availability. It wouldn't matter too much if Penguin goes down for like a second or two. I'm sure that people screaming on the end of the phone. But uh, consistency is more important, so you want to look at the queue and make sure that you've got the data which you, you expect to see. And the plus point is it comes with a Node.js driver, so you can use it from Node. Let's just have a little look, example of this. So again, a big chunk of code, what have we got? Here we're using Node modules to so bring in MongoDB's module, the driver. And there we create a client to be able to talk to our database. And then here, we're connecting to our URL, which is much like a JDBC URL. Um, and then from that connection, which is called DB typically, we can query the database. So the first thing we do is we look for a collection of things, and a collection is like a table in relational sort of land. Um, and then from that collection, we can find all of the things, and then we can put them all into an array, and then we have a call back to receive this array, and we just log them out to the screen, and we close down the connection. So it's all pretty simple um, to be able to connect, and within here you can use JSON like we saw with Restify, so you can just like, insert JSON straight into, into your database without marshalling, unmarshalling, going to SQL, etc. So JavaScript's in a database. Can we do it? Yeah, I think we can. MongoDB and no JS driver. So let's take a trip to the client side. What have we got over here? Well, is it as simple as just saying JavaScript in the browser? Of course. Is that game over? Well, there's normally a few more subtleties once you get beyond that. The problem is how do we structure our application because JavaScript is obviously very low level. We've got a few choices. We could go for a page-based application architecture, a traditional kind of web app, or we can go for the sort of new cool Web 2.0 single page app, SBA. Or, if you are here last week, we could go for uh, what John spoke about, which is the Rocker, the resource oriented client architecture, which is like a kind of a nice happy medium between the two. So for the Penguin, I opted to go for an SPA because I hadn't had much experience in writing one of them. I was interested in seeing what the problems were. Um, and it was before we went to QCon and learned all about the great new world of Rocker. So what does an SPA look like if you've never developed one of these beasts? Well, in the beginning, the page is loaded. Your one page, your single page. <coughs> so up by a web server, so in our case, 
just going to add Node.js and Express there. That's going to deliver our single page. And then this one page will just repeatedly talk to your web service. Using Ajax, so you don't have to make a, another a page request. <coughs> but using Ajax low level itself is a little bit problematic going across browsers and getting sort of compatibility issues sorted out. So most people tend to use jQuery. So we can use jQuery again, it, it gets quite low level. Um, and then it comes back and uh, the data comes back, JSON typically, and we just update ourselves. So sounds pretty simple, doesn't it? But the devil's in the detail. I mean, how do we update ourselves? And there's a number of ways we can achieve it. Again, we can use jQuery, we can do selectors, and we can change attributes, we can inject extra HTML. But if you walk down this path for not too far and you start to discover it's a little bit messy. So ideally we want something where we can have sort of a high level construct of data binding. So we can have our view and we can have our data and we can easily just inject the data and say display this customer and we'll display it on the HTML page. So can we use one of the many, many JavaScript MVC frameworks out there to help us? Well, possibly. Let's have a look at what we've got. So googling around for JavaScript MVC frameworks and you'll hit Backbone.js, you'll find Angular.js, you'll find this little fellow, Ember, popping up. And Knockout, or is it the Iceland logo? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so many to choose from. So I started out with Backbone because it seems to have a lot of momentum, lots of people saying good things, so it seems popular. Let's go for it. So after sort of trying in anger with Backbone for a while, I just found that really all it did is just add a layer to be able to sort of call your web service, which really wasn't that hard because you can just sort of jQuery and Ajax and you know, that wasn't the problem. The problem was sort of mapping all the data that you got back to your UI and updating the fields and all that malarkey. So it really lacks structure. They say they've got structure, but they basically just throw the ball back to you. So they just have a layer of abstraction and go, right, now you update the view so after sort of convincing myself that I had got the, the right end of the sick and it didn't really do what I wanted to do, I kind of gave up on it, looked elsewhere. So we've got AngularJS by Google, must be good, surely. So this is a full end-to-end -end framework, so this, it looks very interesting, I'd like to try it in the future. Um, but it covers a lot of things, so it's got dependency injection for JavaScript, it's got data binding, it's got lots of help for like testing, unit testing, integration testing, which is all good, but when I started out I just really wanted to sort of learn what the problems were and just tackle them one at a time rather than just calling in like a massive, like we do with JE application service, just bring this in, just sort of run this little simple application, or build it up slowly. So I didn't use that, but I'd like to look at that in the future. And again, Vember is another large end-to-end -end framework, um, which looks quite interesting, a little bit more limited to what I could see with Angular, but worth a go if you're interested in trying something out. And then I was about to give up, lose all hope, and then Knockout came knocking on my door. And uh, this just targets just the problem that I was trying to address, which was the data binding problem. And it does this, as uh, some people in the audience may be familiar with, the, the model view view model pattern, which I think we've all got some experience in like .NET and XAML, how that works. So this was very good. So I started to have a little go with Knockout. So what can it do? So consider a teeny bit of HTML. Here we've got a heading. We say hello, we have a span. Now within the span, we've got a magic attribute here. So data dash bind in HTML5, you can have data dash star anything. It's, it's down to you how you use those attributes, but it's valid HTML. So knockout uses it to be able to specify bindings. So we've got data binds, and then here, this is a binding, and we're just binding the text of this element, span, to the name attribute within the, the view model. So here's a view model. It's just a JavaScript function, object, same difference. And then within there we just have 
they start naming. So they set the name attribute to be world. And then to get these two things to uh, sync together, we just say apply, apply bindings to knockout, which is what the KO is. And that sets all the bindings up, and then that's all dynamic. You only have to do that once. So that means if we apply these together in the browser, we suddenly get world injected in into the text of the span element. And the great thing is, that obviously, if you change that view model at any time, then the view updates itself. So you've got this dynamic link between the two. So you can like, really decouple your, your data and your view, as you would hope to do. So it's all good, and I sort of walked down this path for a while, and then got to a point where I was like, well, I've got all these views in my single page app, and it's, it's getting quite big, you know? whole app in a single page. So you can sort of move a mouse, and you can move all your divs into like script tags or type HTML. But again, it's still in one page, and it's just not very scalable. So I was wondering if you can externalize these views out into separate files. And it's a little bit hard to find, but there is a plugin called Knockout.js External Template Engine, which allows you to do just that. So you can bring in templates from other files, and you, know, you can sort of break down the application quite nicely. So that was bogus. That, that sort of points me in a more of a scalable architecture. And then as you sort of start writing more and more of this, you find that you've got a lot of JavaScript code. Again, you want some kind of concept of modules on the client side. So like on the server side with Node, we have Node modules. Can we do a similar thing in the browser? I mean, that'd be really nice. Of course, you can use your old friend the script tag, but it gets a little bit sort of error prone and laborious and the ordering the script tags could be right. So can we use node modules? That would be good. We can't because the node modules are based on a spec called CommonJS, which is trying to standardize how you sort of bring in modules in JavaScript. But they make a lot of assumptions in the spec about the, the environment you're in, so whether you can access the, the file system to load things up or not. Um, and that doesn't really work within a web browser. So you can't use that. But fortunately, there's a competing uh, specification called a catchily named asynchronous module definition, or AMD. And that does allow you to just load things up from a URL within the browser. So an implementation of that is uh, require.js. Oh. So require.js, I mean that, that allows you to pull in modules within the browser, and you can also run it on the server side. Um, I did start out doing it on the server side, but it's a little bit more Phobos syntax than uh, node modules, so I kept node modules on the server side and then require.js and do ones on the client side. But it allows you to split things up and pull in things dynamically, dependencies, so worth looking into. So the final bit of puzzle really is the client-side routing. So what is this? Well, when you go to your app, you go to slash path. It loads up your single page. That's it. That's great. So you can click around, do stuff. But what if you want to go off to like another page, a sort of sub-page within your page? You can't just go slash customers because that's a new page. You're going to lose all your state, your single page app, load in another one. So what's pretty common in these single page apps is to use this sort of hash syntax. So this is using a fragment part of the URL. So the bit with the hash before is your single page hash, and then the bit afterwards normally specifies a part within the page. But what's a lot of these client-side routers, these sort of third-party projects, you can bring them in and they hook into your web browser history. And then when the web browser tries to go to a, a hash slash path, it will then invoke the router, and then you can configure the router to say, when you go to slash customers, I want you to invoke this bit of JavaScript, and then you can put in another template and display that. So this is sort of, you're kind of building a browser within a browser, such as the, uh, the interesting way of single page apps. So I use Director. Um, for this, which is one of many client-side routers, I think it's like Sammy, JS, and lots of other ones, which which are quite good. So, can we do JavaScript in a browser? Well, yeah, 
with Knockout and Require.js and Director, it's pretty easy to do. So we've got JavaScript everywhere. So Penguin, um, this is obviously quite light in sort of implementation details, it's a very high level overview, but if you want to see these libraries in practice, feel free to have a look on GitHub. Um, Penguin is the server side and SPA is a single page app. Um, have a click around and uh, see what you think. So thanks. Any questions? <laughs> what sort of download sizes are you getting the libraries that you're bringing in? I haven't actually uh, calculated the total download size, download size, but they're not that big. A lot of them are compressed. And then Knockout's quite small. Yeah, yeah Knockout's um, pretty small. I was using it in one of my considerations was that for, for mobile devices and um, other things on the web, it's download size can be a big issue, whereas it probably isn't for Penguin and, and, and internet-based yeah. applications. Yeah. It hasn't got a lot of dependencies. So, I mean, for the SPA, we've got Knockout and jQuery and Director. And these are all very small, I mean, just looking in the browser. And it's Something that's worth considering is um, you can get all, you can reference all of these libraries from CDMs like Google's CDM. Um, and at that point, if you're requesting jQuery uh, 1.7, the odds of a given user's browser not already having a cached mm -hmm. copy of Google's CDN to jQuery mm -hmm. from another site are very, very slim. Yeah. So you can get, if you're using commonly used libraries, users don't have to download them just for your app because they've already downloaded them for Gmail or Amazon or whatever else it is that uses those libraries. It's very true. I mean, I started out doing that using CDN, but then I noticed a few people using Penguin, and I'm like, oh, let's go to the page, and it's just blank. Yeah. <laughs> and then I go to the CDN, and it was down. Yeah. And the Google ones are always up. There's some, some of the there are some libraries that will do fallbacks in that situation, where they'll try the CDN, and if it fails, they'll go to some other sources, you know, your own application. Yeah. But that adds a layer of extra performance overhead, because it's got to do the checking, did the CDN work, or yeah. pay you money to take you, choice. Yeah, you just got to weigh up. You know, if it becomes a problem, then I'm sure there's alternatives. Did you consider using any of the JavaScript preprocessors like TypeScript or Coffee? No, I was aware of them. Um, I thought I'd just go native and yep. just keep it real with JavaScript. <laughs> um, I'd like to try them, mm. but again, it's another layer. So this was really about kind of removing layers yeah. rather than yeah. adding more stuff on. But yeah. I would like to like look at Dart and things like mm. that, which uh, seem to fix a lot of the yeah. niggles of JavaScript. What kind of IDE support is there for what do you want to develop like a reasonable sized app? For JavaScript. So, yeah. Well obviously if you didn't know the JS and resolve those modules, is there any code completion and support for any yeah, of the I read the documentation I just use Eclipse and the JavaScript uh, editor that comes with all the web tool stuff, which is okay. Um, it doesn't really auto complete that well at all. Um, and it comes up with lots of erroneous errors as well. So, yeah, I think there are better tools. Um, Some people use like Sublime and that for JavaScript. I think that's one of the appeals of using TypeScript is that you, uh, that I've never used it myself, but I'm told that the Visual Studio support for TypeScript is very, very good because once you put typing on top of JavaScript, you can do code completion mm. yeah, things like yeah. that yeah. much more efficiently. Yeah. Is designed to be IDE friendly. That's the thing, it's one of the drawbacks of dynamic languages, yeah. isn't it? But of course, you do then have to use Visual Studio. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Big drawback. How do, you, how do you go about unit testing? Ah, yes. So I was going to go into that, but I thought I probably wouldn't have time. Um, so I did that, I played around with a bit of unit testing um, after I did the first sort of release of Penguin that we've been using. Um, I end up using Mocha, which is, again, there's so many different unit testing frameworks out there. So I just want one, I just want a JUnit. There's ones that work in the browser, out the browser, and phantom browsers. And so Mocha is quite good. It, it's got the normal sort of constructs that you expect for your sort of test driven development um, setup, tear down. There's also got like BDD stuff as well. Um, but then you've got, there's a whole host, there's other ones, there's like Jasmine and then you've got all the kind of integration test ones that can fire up browsers. Um, I know Google's got one. 
testicular, I think. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Greatly named product. Um, there's a phantom JS. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a lot of support, but it's trying to trying to get to grips with all the different libraries and weighing up what's new and cool because it's everyone's coming out of libraries every single day. And even stuff like mocking was it took quite a while. There's this one called Synon JS that I used to do mocking. And it works quite well, although I pretty much found a bug on the first test I wrote and they accepted it as a bug. So it's like, oh, it doesn't really feel you have confidence, does it, when like, the testing tools have got bugs in them themselves. So there are frameworks and you can uh, integrate into NPN. So where you saw NPN installed, you can do NPN tests and then you can, like, within your package JSON, get tests to then invoke mocker. So you can sort of turn NPN into a bit of a maven and run all your tests and it all comes out with pretty ticks on the console and everything. So, yeah, if you look at the GitHub, it's got a few tests and sort of start doing some integration tests. I don't know if I push that back, but just to sort of start up a web server with Node and then fire requests and do some sort of full end to end testing of the web servers. So, it's all possible, but yeah. Dynamic language makes it a little bit awkward. It's like, why is my test not working? Why is it not working? Oh. Yeah, because there's an error there and it just consumed it because it's dynamic. <laughs> so does the uh, knockout bind you very quickly by jQuery UI? So if you wanted all, yes. to use all of those kind of components. Okay. Yeah, there's no reason why it can't. I mean, jQuery UI is just special HTML. Um, so you just bind it to HTML and yeah. It's yeah, I know did a project last week and put knockout in with um, jQuery UI technologies and things like the calendar components <coughs> and it was all bound directly to the new model and it works a tree. Okay. Yeah, it's very good. I was very impressed by knockout. It's just mm. it seemed very solid and everything. I was like, oh yeah, but what about this? And looking at the website, I was like, oh yeah, this case, right, great, we've got a solution. So it's it's good. Written by a guy at Microsoft, but don't let that put me in the pocket. There was a big talk at KubeCon. That was him. Yeah. That was the guy who wrote it. Yeah. There. Um, and their um, cloud based app server model. But what was about Knockout is, is really interesting. As, as was their, um, their cloud app. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, very, very interesting. I know Simon's using Knockout in his. Um, Environment browser. Yes, well, yeah, so yeah. He's, he's found it pretty good. Yeah, it just cuts a lot of the boilerplate code out and yeah. works the way you want it to work. You stop jumping at anything procedural to, to manipulate your you, you DOM or your page. Yeah. You're just yeah. not manipulating your page in the same way that yeah. you normally would. And you can really feel you can get away with that. Once you've seen your page work a bit, don't, you don't need testing for your page, you just put your testing straight, straight onto your model and that's yeah. probably enough for most apps. Yeah, that is good. I mean, you've got the simple sort of substitution like we did with the text, just going hello world, but of course there's more powerful constructs where you can like, iterate over things, so you can just add something to a collection and suddenly a new row of a table will appear. And <coughs> it's, it's the thing we didn't see there was that the binding is two-way. So if you bind the value of an input, yeah. your model is updated when the user types into the input field. It doesn't yeah. just update the, the browser yeah, and the model. It, it does calculated values as well. It's quite difficult to mm. work out how to get the pattern right within your view model to, to put calculated values in. But you can have some really quite um, complex algorithms mm. that are calculating. And um, when you change one of the inputs, um, the whole calculation is re is, is rebuilt, right? Um, and it's it's done it by just examining which um, which bindings have, have actually been um, or observables they have, and which observables have been changed, and then it recalculates the thing for you. So if you've got some order total in a in a shopping basket, for example, and you've changed one of the attributes of one of the one of the order items, then it will recalculate it all for you. Um, or maybe even you know go off and calculate your postage for you as well, based on the total weight of your of your shopping basket or something like that. It's, it, it just takes care of it. Yeah, that's very clever. Is there any support for? I mean, how did I don't know. Probably a difficult question to answer. But 
And if you wanted to do your own binding of some sort, and I'm thinking of a particular time, I might be working on a little app or using RAFR.js to do diagramming, um, but then to somehow save that model and synchronize that model. Then be allowed to write your own binding here. Yeah. Yeah. I haven't tried it. But yeah, it's got custom bindings. Again, I haven't had a need for it, but it's pretty open. Any more for any more? No, I mean, Tom's got money.com. He's just uh, knocking out. Yeah. Um, which was interesting. It was the first time I encountered it. Um, Kieran had an interesting example yesterday, I think. He used Node.js because he wanted to get a big HTML file and he wanted to parse it out and split a bunch of divs out into um, separate files yeah. named after the idea of the div. And having discounted said and walk as being a bit complicated because of all of the nesting. <laughs> <laughs> he did it in about 10 lines of note. Yeah. It is it's very good for just sort of succinct programs. Mm. You can pack a lot, a big punch into a few lines in JavaScript. Cool. Well, thanks. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.